Hello everyone. What I want to do is talk about how to take the Fourier transform of an LP function. Um, and this is something that really just doesn't pop up for Fourier series. Um, so we didn't really talk about it. And that's there's nearly nothing uh, here. Um, because what happens for um, Fourier series is well, when we take the Fourier transform, and if f is an LP, or sorry, when we take the Fourier coefficients, well, you can write this, uh, write the definition down, write this integral, you can smash in absolute values, and you'll see that this is, well, less than or equal to in modulus f of t, modulus f of t rather, and um, using Holder's inequality if p is between, um, one and infinity strictly, doing nothing if p is one, or just throwing out the L infinity norm when p is infinity, it's trivial that this is less than or equal to the LP norm. Okay, so in particular, this whole thing here is L1, so there's no ambiguity with defining the Fourier coefficients. And in particular, Fourier coefficients form an L infinity sequence the L infinity norm is less than or equal to the LP norm. I'm sorry, the L infinity norm of the Fourier, trans, Fourier um, coefficients um, is less than or equal to the uh, LP norm of F. Now, the situation is quite a bit different um, for the Fourier transform. Okay. So uh, remember what we did for the Fourier transform. Uh, for L2. Well, remember, um, the Fourier transform for an L1 function is perfectly well defined. Uh, remember the definition, it's f of u, integral f of u, e to the minus 2 pi i x dot u du. So same silly game. Um, you know, this whole thing here in the, this whole integrand here for any x is obviously L1. Um, if f is L1, so in particular, Fourier transform of an L1 function is an L infinity function. Um, and the L infinity norm of the Fourier transform is bounded by the L1 norm of the original function. So. Um, so yeah, what did we do? We, we um, said, well, for f and L2, <clears throat> so, uh, well, I'm not going to write it down, it's in the previous video, but for f and L2, we take fn and L1 intersect L2, where fn converges to f and L2, um, and define the Fourier transform of f as the limit of the Fourier transform of fn. Because the Fourier transform is an isometry on L1, intersect L2. This limit is going to exist on uh, as an L2 function. And the Fourier transform defined that way um, is an isometry. You have Fourier inversion. And it's a unique extension of the Fourier transform from L1 intersect L2 to uh, L2. So what we could do for LP functions is try to mimic that. And we could hope that for um, fixed p, let's say p is between 1 and infinity, strictly, that there exists a q depending on p. So perhaps it's a little redundant then to say cpq, but anyway. So we could hope that there, is, there exists such a q for fixed p and a constant cpq independent of f. Um, in L1 intersect LP, where this is true. So in particular, we'll, we will at least know that the Fourier transform is an LQ. We know the Fourier transform just in virtue of this. We know it, the Fourier transform exists, and it's, uh, it's an L infinity uh, function. <clears throat> but this will tell us that the Fourier transform is an LQ, and we have this bound if this is true, and then we can basically do the same thing. Pick an fn, an L1 intersect LP, 
uh, converging to F and LP. Define F in this way. Because LQ is a Bonnock space, uh, Fn of hat will be Cauchy because Fn is Cauchy because it's convergent. So then this limit here will, you know, in virtue of one, will make perfect sense um, in LQ. So F hat by this definition will be in LQ and it'll satisfy uh, itself this bound here. And this will be actually the unique extension of uh, the Fourier transform from L1 intersect LP to LQ. Uh, rather, sorry, from L1 intersect LP to uh, LP. So this will define the Fourier transform for an LP function and it'll spit out uh, an LQ function. Okay, so. Um, I want to now prove that if one is true for all L1 intersect LP, then in fact we must have Q is P prime. Okay. And um, yeah, so this argument here is it's hard to find this argument. Um, and basically, I'm taking this argument from a really interesting book, uh, Analysis by Lieben Loss. Um, it's a really, yeah, it's a really interesting book um, talking, you know, it's at the, at the level of our um, uh, real analysis prelim. So it talks about measure theory, integration, LP spaces, and then it gets into way more advanced stuff like what we're doing, Fourier transform, um, then talks about Sobolev spaces, distributions, Sobolev inequalities, and uh, Schrodinger equations, um, yeah. So fascinating book if you're interested in PDE. Uh, I highly recommend getting it if you're interested in PDE or mathematical physics, rigorous mathematical physics. Okay, right. So why must Q be P prime? We're going to do what's called a scaling argument, and this is an argument you do all the time in PDE theory. It's extremely elementary, um, but it really tells you crucial information, you know, that if you want something true, then something has to be, uh, you have some restrictions. Um, so don't even look for what you want to be true without these restrictions. Okay, so remember that the Fourier transform, we did this for Gaussians, but there's no issue with doing this for general L1 functions. So if F lambda of X is F over F of X over lambda, then we can take the Fourier transform of F lambda, perfectly nice L1 function. Uh, so we do a U sub or we do a change of variables. Um, U goes to lambda U. Uh, if you haven't seen again, like before, if you haven't seen change of variables and N dimensions, just uh, thing about like a calc one substitution, um, you do V uh, is U over lambda. Uh, so what you really get is uh, X dot lambda U. Um, well, all I'm really doing here is just moving over the lambda in this dot product, the ordinary linear algebra dot product. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, and uh, right, nice thing about here. So this is just what you get when you do your change of variables. This lambda to the n. Uh, and again, if if you want n equals one, this is just what you get when you do uh, v is u over lambda. Um, du is lambda dv. Pull out the lambda. Um, so this is just lambda to the n, Fourier transform of f, plugged in lambda x. So in particular, multiply both sides by lambda to the minus n, we get the following, okay? So what we're going to do is plug this into one and see what we're forced, see what we're basically forced to conclude about p and q. 
So whenever you have quantities, particularly when you're doing differential equations, you know, partial differential equations, or even ordinary differential equations, um, and you want to, you know, want to prove something about that or you want to prove some inequalities lp lq inequalities between a function and its derivative it never hurts to rescale things um you know, you know using um uh, the chain rule or or change of variables whatever um and see what information you get from this rescaling okay um Right, so we have the Fourier transform in a very elementary way, satisfies this very unique scaling property. So let's put it to good use. Okay, so let's look at the LQ norm of F hat. Again, we're assuming one is true and we're assuming F is an L1 intersect LQ. So, uh, right, what I have here is just trivially, obviously, the LQ norm. Okay, so what I'm doing from here to here is kind of working backwards, doing a substitution, uh, x go or a change of variables, x goes to x over lambda. Again, if you want to think in terms of n equals one, this is just u is lambda uh, x. Um, so dx is uh, du over lambda. So when n equals one, the lambdas cancel. So it's just going to be the integral f hat of u modulus to the q du it's exactly the same thing here just different letter um anyway whatever uh however you do it uh, or whatever you want to think uh these two are just trivially equal um okay so let me plug in for here and let me pull out the lambda to the n so i'm pulling this lambda to the n out So uh, this is lambda to the n over q. And all I'm doing is just, again, taking what we uh, found out about the Fourier transform, uh, this rescaling property, plug this in. Okay, so um, because there's a q here and it's a one over q, I can just pull out this, uh, and we get, if I pull this outside, it's just lambda to the minus n. So lambda to the n over q times lambda to the minus n. Well, it's just this here. Okay. And without this lambda here, it's just the LQ norm of F hat. Okay. Uh, but again, if F is an L1 intersect LQ, then F lambda is certainly an L1 intersect. Sorry, if F is an L1 intersect LP, then F lambda is an L1 intersect LP. F lambda is literally. F lambda of x is just f of x over lambda. Um, right, and so here we're assuming one is true for all functions in L1 intersect LP. So it's true for f lambda. So this is what we get, uh, sorry, didn't want to do that. This is what we get from uh, one, okay, just, just using one. Now, finally, let's end this little game here, this little elementary argument, by dumping in what f lambda is. And again, uh, no subtlety here, x over lambda. So I'm going to do one final substitution or one final change of variables. x goes to lambda x, or n equals 1, u is just x over lambda. So you really, uh, ignoring this here, you really get inside the integral x lambda rather to the n when you do a change of variables. But I can pull that out, it's lambda to the n over p, like I have here. Um, okay, so what we get, uh, the conclusion is um, that, for any f in L1 intersect L uh, P, we have the LQ norm of the Fourier transform is less than or equal to the CPQ lambda to the n one over Q minus one over P prime. 
Um, and that's just, so all that is, is um, combine this here to n one over q minus one plus one over p. Um, right, but minus one plus one over p is minus one over p prime. So, right, so this here is lambda to the n one over q minus one over p prime. Okay, so this is true for any lambda positive whatsoever if one is true. If this is true for all um, f and l1 intersect lp, uh, where cpq is independent of f. Okay, so, um, right, so I claim that unless p uh, is, I'm sorry, unless q is p prime, this is uh, absurd. This just makes no sense. Okay, why is that? Uh, sorry, let me go down here. Um, well, right, so let me get rid of all this here. All right, so let me just uh, kind of write some things down in this little space. Uh, there's no need to go to the whiteboard, I don't think. <clears throat> Okay, so let's assume P, let's assume Q is not P prime. So uh, let's say Q, um, or let's say assume, uh, assume Q is bigger, or let's assume Q uh, is less than P prime, okay? So then in this case, That means this whole thing is bigger than zero, okay? So what I can do, so this CPQ is independent of lambda. Um, <clears throat> lambda can do whatever the hell it wants. Um, there's no restriction on lambda for what we were just doing, um, other than it's positive. So we can let lambda go to zero. Uh, in this case, this is uh, positive. Okay, f is an LP, so this is finite. This is finite. So when lambda goes to zero, we conclude that for any f in L1 intersect LP, the LQ norm of the Fourier transform, um, so I, should mention when I don't have anything here, this is really over Rn, uh, just kind of tough to squeeze that in everywhere. Um, so if I don't write anything, it's over R uh, to the n. All right, so yeah, the conclusion is that this is less than or equal to zero, which means f hat is zero almost everywhere for any f in L1 intersect LP. Same thing if, uh, uh, sorry, same thing if Q is bigger than P prime. Well, in that case, this whole thing here is obviously less than zero. Um, one over Q is less than one over P prime. So we can let lambda, this looks like an X here, but this is lambda. We can let lambda go to infinity so that this here becomes, this whole thing becomes zero. So we have the same conclusion. F hat is zero almost everywhere for every F in L1 intersect LP. Um, so, I mean, this is silly, obviously. I'm just literally reading off from here, but less than or equal to zero means it is zero, obviously. And this is just wrong. This is just false. Um, right, Q not equal to P prime means F hat is zero almost everywhere for any F in L1 intersect LP. This is wrong. Uh, just take a Gaussian. 
the Gaussian is an LP for every P you want whatsoever. Um, the Fourier transform is itself. We carefully did that computation. So um, this is certainly not zero almost everywhere. It's never zero. Okay, so what's the, what's the point here? Uh, the point is that we get this absurd <coughs> contradiction. No, that f hat equals zero almost everywhere for every f and l1 intersect lp <coughs> if q is not equal to p prime. So if one is true, we have to have q is p prime. Okay. And also, you can show by examples by dumping in. Uh, specific F, actually Gaussians, uh, where you um, basically stick in um, an A plus BI here. You know, you're just shoving uh, A plus BI, where A and B are uh, both not zero. By throwing in those examples and doing a careful calculation of the Fourier transform, you can show that one can't be true for all f and l1 intersect lp if p is bigger than two okay so this leads us to the following theorem uh and this is called the hausdorff young theorem if p is uh between one and two then the fourier transform uniquely extends from l1 intersect lp to lp with one being true, again, Q has to be P prime. So uh, the Fourier transform extends to L1 intersect LP to LP, and it takes uh, LP, this unique extension takes LP to LQ, and actually CPQ is, you can set it to be one, interestingly enough. Okay, so how do we prove this? We prove this using what's called interpolation. So this itself is important, um, but perhaps the, the idea uh, in, of interpolation is maybe even more important, which I wanna get into now. Um, so uh, a lot of times you just throw down, throw out you know, an interpolation theorem and Here's this wonderful interpolation theorem. Let's use it without really explaining where the hell anything comes from or why it, it makes sense. So what I want to do is um, introduce a very simple proposition that explains kind of where interpolation comes from. So this is interpolation between LP spaces. So let's say P0 and P1 are any positive numbers whatsoever. Let's say P is strictly between P0 and P1. So we don't know if P0 is bigger than P1 or P1 is bigger than P0. We just know that P is between P0 and P1. So in particular, P0 is not equal to P1. P is strictly between P0 and P1. Let's say F is an LP0 intersect LP1. What I'm doing works for any measure space, let's just assume it's, uh, again, uh, you know, that everything's over the Euclidean space Rn. Then I claim that F actually is an LP. And we can do a lot better. Um, in fact, um, the LP norm of, uh, of F is less than or equal to, um, well, I'll get to this in a second. Okay, so the idea here is that we can interpolate between uh, these two endpoints, F is an LP zero and F is an LP one, to get that F is an LP for any P between P zero and P one. Okay, so what's the proof? Uh, so, Let's assume uh, P0 is less than P1. You can just switch P0 and P1 otherwise. Um, okay. So let's say theta 
is this number here. And it's between zero and one because we're assuming this is true and everything's positive. So this is the same thing as saying one over P1 is less than one over P is less than one over P0. So one over P0 minus one over P, this here is certainly positive. One over P0 minus one over P1, again, is also positive. So this whole thing is positive. Um, so in particular, it's bigger than zero. Obviously, one over P0 minus one over P1 from this here is less than one over P0 minus one over P1. So this is certainly less than one. So where does this number come from? Well, really, um, the number comes from this here. And this is the crucial kind of thing we want. We want some theta between zero and one, where one over P is one minus theta over P zero, theta over P one. So you could start from this here and then just simply solve for theta. Um, and assuming this is true, conclude, as we just did a moment ago, that theta is between zero and one. And what you really, really want is not necessarily, well, you do want this, but what you really want is trivially multiply both sides by P. This is what you really, really want so that you can use Holder's inequality. In particular, well, theta is between zero and one. So both of these, if they add up to one, if we have two numbers between zero and one that add up to one, um, or sorry, we have two positive numbers that add, you add, you take two positive numbers, certainly both of these are positive because theta is between zero and one. So you're adding up these two positive numbers to get one. The two numbers you add up have to both be uh, in zero to one. Otherwise, well, I mean, these are positive. Both of these have to be less than one, because otherwise, if one of them is less than one, you're going to get something bigger than one. The point here is you can use Holder's inequality with respect to uh, both of the, or one over both of these exponents. So let's do exactly that. So I just trivially write P as P minus theta P plus theta P. I'm going to use Holder's inequality with respect to the exponents P zero over one minus theta uh, P and the exponent P one over theta P. So I do that. That here. Okay. Well, um, right, so let's just do exactly that. Multiply this here. Well, what happens when I multiply this by P0 over 1 minus theta P? Well, these cancel. These cancel, and I'm left with P0. So I'm left with. Uh, P0. And this is just what's left over from Holder's inequality, 1 minus theta P over P0. Same kind of thing here. Um, you're left with P1 because um, the theta P's cancel here. So you're left with P1, and then you have your, your yeah, one over what you're using for Holder's inequality, which is exactly what this is, theta P over P1. Okay, so now what I could do is raise both sides to the one over P, get rid of this here. Uh, this is a theta. Get rid of, uh, sorry. This is a theta. So if I raise both sides to the P, I get rid of this here. I get rid of this here. So we have the um, quantitative bound. So this here, let's be, let's be clear here. 
Um, this whole thing, obviously, what I have here is just the L P0 norm of F. This whole thing here is just the L P1 norm of F. So this is just LP0 to the one minus theta, LP1 of theta. Okay, so we get this uh, fact here. Um, and um, right, so uh, the same argument works uh, if um, P0 uh, is um, bigger than P1. So this is exactly what we get. Okay. We get exactly for this very specifically defined theta uh, right here, or in particular for uh, theta between zero and one defined in such a way that one over P is one minus theta P zero plus theta P one, we get the L norm, LP norm of F is less than or equal to LP zero norm of one minus theta, uh, of F to the one minus theta, LP one norm, of f raised to the theta. Okay. So yeah, this here. Uh, so hopefully this kind of explains where this kind of exponent is going to come from, and where this kind of inequality is going to come from. And I didn't do the case p one is infinity here. Um, that is just easy homework uh, here. Implicitly, I'm assuming p one is less than infinity. Okay, so. Let's uh, talk about um, extending this idea to operators, linear operators between LP and LQ spaces. So I'm actually going to follow um, a set of lecture notes by Terry Tao. Um, it's one of the rare sets of notes that really carefully does um, interpolation. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean in a second. So let's say big F is the vector space of all measurable F on Rn, where it's um, it's simple, so it's F simple, and has finite measure. So all that means is F is a linear combination of of um, yeah, F is a linear combination of uh, characteristic functions over some sets, I don't know, of EJ, where each EJ has finite measure. So trivially, this is in every single LP space over Rn that you could ever want. There's really no, nothing there. And clearly big F is dense in uh, all LP spaces. Okay, so we have the following theorem, Restoran theorem. So let's say we have P0, P1 between 0 and infinity, and let's say we have Q0, Q1 between 1 and uh, infinity. Okay. Um, right. So fix theta between 0 and 1, and let's say one over p theta and one over p q is defined in this way. It's basically defined just like uh, we have here, except with respect to p and q. <clears throat> okay, um, let's say we have a linear map. So t is linear from f to script M, what this is just measurable functions on Rn. Okay, and let's assume this linear map satisfies that Tf times G is an L1 function for F and G in big F. Okay, so this is very, so most of the time this, well, let me, sorry, let me finish this up here. So let's assume that we have the following two bounds uh, from L P zero to L 
um, sorry, this should be uh, Q0. So this is LQ0, LP0, LQ1, LP1. So let's say we have the following bounds from uh, LP0 to LQ0 and LP1 to LQ1 for F in uh, big F. Then we can interpolate between these two bounds to get the following um, bound from L. Uh, from LP0 to LQ0 for all F. So for all such F, I mean for all F and big F. Okay. All right. So what the way, if you go to Google and search Hausdorff, oh, sorry, search um, Riesz-Lorin theorem, it's usually stated um, if T is linear, uh, it takes um, LP, zero plus LP1 to LP, LQ0 plus LQ1. And if T is bounded from um, L, uh, P0 to LQ0, if T is bounded from LP1 to LQ1, then T is bounded from uh, LP theta to LQ theta. Um, and that's not exactly true. It's, it's really T extends to a bounded operator. And that distinction is not trivial because we're going to apply this to the Fourier transform. And we can't really talk about a, a bound from LP theta to LQ theta when we don't even know what the hell the Fourier transform is for anything other than L1 or L2. If P is not L1, and if P is not L2, we do not know what the Fourier transform is. On the other hand, um, and this is why, you know, Terry Tao, you know, states the Riesz-Thorin Riesz theorem in this way. This is perfectly suited to, um, for the Fourier transform. So, um, right, let's check that this here is true for the Fourier transform, <clears throat> okay? Well, there's really nothing to it. Uh, F here is in, uh, so yeah, F, let's say F and G are in F, um, so, Sorry. So what I'm going to, yeah, I want to use this with the Fourier transform. So let's say T is Fourier transform. So that means, uh, well, TF, so this is a subset of L2. TF is certainly an L2. Um, or rather, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, you can do that or it's, obviously L2, L1 intersect L2. Um, so this is certainly an F, well, sorry, this is certainly an L2. F is a subset of L2. So G is an L2. So just trivially by whole, there's an equality. TF, G is an L1. Okay. All right. So, um, Right, so yeah, let's do a judicious choice. Let's pick a judicious choice of P1, P0, Q, um, Q1, Q0. And it's important that P1 and Q1 can possibly be infinity. In applications, it often is infinity. All right, so let's say Q0 is P0 is 2. Let's say P1 is 1, and Q1 is infinity. T is a Fourier transform. So we already checked that the Fourier transform satisfies this condition here. We just check that. Before I say anything, I, I want to mention, I'll, I'll put up a, the PDF uh, where you can find a proof of Riesz-Thorin, proof of exactly the statement here. Believe it or not, the proof is really a consequence of um, the maximum modulus principle in complex analysis. 
um, which is really, you know, probably very surprising. Um, but you might think, what on earth does the maximum modulus principle have to do from complex analysis? What does that have to do with anything here? Um, well, um, yeah, so I'll, you know, so yeah, um, and I'll, I'll put a link up to actually in the video, uh, the, the notes that Terry Tao or Terry Tao proves this using the maximum modulus principle. Um, Okay, so let's prove Hausdorff Young. <clears throat> okay, so um, right. So uh, first of all, we're going to prove that a one is a zero is one, the bounds that we get. So so for little f and uh, script f again, this is uh, certainly an L one intersect L two. Then little f. So we know F is an uh, the Fourier transform is an isometry when we take the L2 norm of such functions. So F hat, the LQ0 norm of F hat is the LP0 norm of F hat. Both are two. We already figured out the L infinity norm of the Fourier transform um, of an L1 function. Well, again, just smashing absolute values. Uh, so we get uh, an L1 to L infinity bound. <clears throat> okay. So for theta between zero and one fixed, um, so yeah, we just proved that A1 is A0 is one. So for theta between zero and one fixed, we just proved this. Well, that's nice. We don't really want this. We want, we just wanna scratch out P prime and we wanna be able to just kind of scratch out uh, P here, okay? Well, the key here is, and, and restoring is that you can pick theta to be whatever you so desire as long as it's between zero and one. So let's judiciously pick theta. Okay. And this is what you do in practice when you actually apply restoren in practice. So there's really not much uh, subtlety here. You want, um, well, sorry. So before I say anything, what is one over p theta? Um, right. Let me get rid of all this here. So for what we're doing, remember um, p theta, or sorry, p zero was uh, I believe one. Uh, sorry. P0 is P1 is 2. So this whole thing here, well, I'll just trivially plug this in. 1 minus theta. Uh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. So it's 1 minus theta over 2 plus theta over 2. And here, um, Q, uh, right, um, Q1 is infinity. Q0 equals one. So what is this here? Again, there's not a whole hell of a lot of subtlety here. Just dump in. Uh, so when I say infinity, you know, implicitly one over infinity is zero. So this, there's nothing here. So this whole thing is just one minus theta over, um, uh, well, it's just one minus theta. Okay. Okay, so, right, so let's go, um, uh, one second. I think I screwed this up. Q zero is P zero is two. Um, 
So I'm sorry about that. Uh, Q0, right. Let's try one more time. Uh, sorry about that. Q0 is P0 is 2. Um, right. P, uh, Q1 is infinity. P1 is 1. Okay, so, right, this whole thing here. Now this becomes uh, one minus theta over two, P1 is one plus theta. This whole thing here becomes, Q1 is still infinity, this is two though, so it's one minus theta over two, okay? So what we need to, what we want to do is we want this here. Like I said, we really just want to kind of scratch this off and say this is P prime. Well, we can do the next best thing and just say, well, let's um, pick theta. Let's hope we can pick theta so that this is one over uh, P prime. So that P theta is P prime. And let's hope that for this judiciously picked theta, such that this is one over P prime, this turns out to be um, one over, uh, sorry, one over uh, P. So then, um, or rather we want this to be, uh, we want this to be p, then we want this to be uh, p prime. Okay, so we're going to hope that we're going to try to pick theta judiciously so that this thing becomes one over p. So then p theta is p, and we're going to hope that with this judiciously picked theta, that um, this turns out to be one over p prime. So that q theta is p prime. So that this is true. Okay, and this is where um, this is where the condition that p is uh, between one and two is absolutely crucial. Okay, so let me get rid of all this here. Okay, so we do this. We solve for theta. We, we check what theta has to be. So if p theta is uh, p, Theta has to be one over p minus one over two, whole thing times two. Okay. So I distribute to two. And this is between zero and one because, well, one is be, uh, p is between one and two. So, um, yeah. So trivially, this is between zero and one. So, yeah, so I mean, again, if you want, you can really just work backwards, set theta, be, theta to be this here. And if you set theta to be this, then P theta will be P. So let's figure out what Q theta then is. <clears throat> well, just dump in for theta. Theta over two is one over P minus two. So, Distribute to minus one, it's one minus one over P, and lo and behold, this is one over P prime. So, yeah, by really setting theta to be this here, we um, conclude that P theta is P, and Q theta is P prime. So, just reading off of um, restoring, we get the uh, we get exactly what we want. So this is exactly what you do in, in uh, real, you know, other applications of restoring. You basically solve for theta, uh, put restrictions on P so that theta is between zero and one. <clears throat> and then you read off what Q theta has to be. I mean, from the, our rescaling argument, we already showed what um, you know, what we need for Q 
Q, it, it was P prime. Um, but this is just saying to get, you know, all we get from restoring is that Q theta is P prime. If theta is this here, and hence P theta is P. Okay, right. So what we've proven carefully using this version of Restorin is that this is true for all F simple um, with um, finite, uh, finite measure support. Now the rest is an easy, uh, you know, uh, approximation argument, an easy density argument that I'll leave for homework. Um, you basically do exactly what we did for the Fourier transform for L2 um, to prove that these bounds hold for all F and L1 intersect LP and then do what we talked about before. Okay, so um, <coughs> Right, so what I want to do next, I'll do in the, next, in the next video, is talk about the Fourier transform on the short space, um, and we'll prove that it's a, a bijection um, from the short space on itself. We'll define the short space, and then we're going to kind of get into the real meat of the rest of this course, which is proving um, LP convergence of truncated. Uh, Fourier inversion um, and LP convergence of, of Fourier series um, via what's called the Hilbert transform. Um, and that'll lead us to um, all kinds of useful things. Um, a different kind of interpolation theorem called Marcinkiewicz interpolation theorem. Um, so if you're actually interested in mathematical history, there's really rich history. Um, be behind uh, the mathematicians um, Hausdorff um, uh, and uh, Marcinkiewicz actually both very tragically died. Uh, the Nazis killed Hausdorff, and it's believed that the Soviets killed Marcinkiewicz in the Katyn Forest Massacre, if you're interested in history. Um, but anyway, yeah, interesting history uh, here. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, we'll talk about a different kind of interpolation theorem. Uh, we'll talk about weak, weak type inequalities. We'll talk about maximal functions. Um, we'll you know, talk about a lot of really interesting, useful, deep tools um, that are a little deeper than what we've done before. Okay, so um, yeah, so long, take care. So sorry this was so long. Um, until next time.